welcome to the uh, to, to the session. My name is Ted Ryan. Um, I, I I work for an organisation called RNR organisation. Uh, we are a small infrastructure support group within uh, within uh, Birmingham, um, and I've been working with Agent Better within the Sparkbrook area for the past um, probably four or five four or five years now. Um, if we go round um, the, the group, if we, if we introduce ourselves at the moment uh, and then we come back to me and I'll explain uh, where, we, where we go from there, okay? So um, we've got two Naeems at the moment. One of them is called Cam. <laughs> so Cam, Cam Naeem, <laughs> can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, hello, good morning. I don't know why I'm being named today. Um, <laughs> no, I sent you the link. Yeah, okay. it's coming, it's coming on his link. Oh. Okay. Um, so I'm Cam. Um, I work in the uh, in ACP Ashiana Community Family Wellbeing Centre as the um, in the Women's Wellbeing Hub. Um, so I work in the community supporting women uh, with physical um, health, mental, and emotional health as well. Thank you, uh, Rabina. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi. Yes, I'm Rubina. I'm smart. Uh, I'm uh, from Smart Women Community Training Center in Spark Hill, Sparkbrook as well. So uh, our center providing the activities for wood for the local women. Okay, thank you. And and Naeem. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my involvement within Aging Better, the work that I did, was actually during April 2019 to April 2020. And my presentation is the kind of experiences and the journeys that I went through supporting small groups and organisations. Okay, thanks. Okay, a little bit about Sparkbrook uh, and the Sparkbrook Aging Better programme to begin with before we then ha have uh, an input from the other, the other uh, members. Um, Sparkbrook is, was both a ward and uh, a district within Birmingham. It's just southwest of the, the inner city. Got high immigrant communities, um, which have changed over the years. Um, you know, from the Irish to the Asian to the to um, African. Um, large number of community-led initiatives, which have uh, historically been funded through um, a range of external funding programs, going back to the mid the mid seventies, um, and stuff like that. Huge number of. Um, issues, health issues, education achieve, uh, achievement and employment issues, low income um, and sometimes low employment expectations as well. Uh, and the the ward, the current ward of Sparkbrook and Bolsall Heath uh, East is the uh, number one ward in the Birmingham 2019 in Index of Multiple Deprivation. Um, and has been the area has been constantly within the top 10 percent of the most deprived wards within the, in the area. As an Aging Better uh, program, uh, whilst it focused on the Sparkbrook ward, as was, I say pre-2018, that's because the ward boundaries changed in 2018 in Birmingham. Um, one of the things we did was recognise that communities don't always operate within ward boundaries, um, and especially some of the um, Asian communities um, you know, drift across to other facilities which have been developed elsewhere. So we worked within sort of parameters around the area and, and, and everything like that. We developed uh, an Aging Better hub, which worked with a number of community-led networks and developed those networks. Um, and that supported, um, that, was, that, that, that was led by people from the community developing an activity uh, working with people within within that area, and some of those activities were hosted by some of the community organisations with, with, within the area. We had the local action plan, which then looked at how do we develop infrastructure activity and did some training and development for um, for the current community groups and the existing community groups and stuff like that. So today's deliveries. Um, and what we what we are planning is just some short presentations, some short discussions from um, both uh, Naeem, Cam, and Rabina uh, about their work within uh, within a, with Aging Better and within engaging people within the area. Um, 
So from, from that point of view, um, we, 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 we want to look at how, you know, the differences of that, that it's, it, it, it made and, and stuff like that. Um, so with further ado, I'll start off with Naeem. And Naeem, Naeem's role within Aging Better was to work with some of the uh, some of the networks and to work with some of the organisations to actually uh, take them forward. Rabina runs a grass, well, what would be described as a grassroots organisation with access to women within the area. And Cam works for, as she said, Asian um, Community Project um, and, you, and, and runs the wellbeing programme there, which has been very successful online over the last 12 months. So it's about five or seven, between five and seven minutes talking about what you do and what they do. And then we've got some questions. If you want to start putting um, some questions in the Q&A or in the chat, I'll be monitoring those and then we'll try and answer those questions in the second part of the session this morning. OK, uh, so with no further ado, Naeem, over to you. And good morning. Um, I really want to start off by saying is that working with any kind of communities has always been rewarding, uh, breathtaking, just to see the amount of people and places and spaces actually operate within the area that I've been working. And in some cases, it's been inspiring as well as aspirational. I'm going to come start first with not an introduction, but with a conclusion. And the conclusion is, that I wish to present is that to work within the communities, we have to actually ensure that we're working with people, mobilizing them to actually take leadership and control, uh, not by control of just leading something, but taking control of a particular issue or uh, aspect in the community. And is how do you actually create that journey? And one of the key aspects that we started right at the beginning was to actually develop a narrative. And one of the key things within the private communities, there's so many issues that affect the local community and many small and large organizations. What they tend to do is they don't actually try to deal with a single issue. They will try to deliver everything. One of the key experiences that I found with grassroots organizations is that how small they are, they are very, powerful of actually engaging with the local people and these could be through their family networks or friend networks or even their social networks but majority of these networks are very informal so most of the contacts are usually uh, verbal so the whole mechanism of the initial period was let's initiate a conversation let's build something that can actually identify in local areas and the key narrative and where my conclusion comes to is that to ensure that you create something which is powerful, it requires the ingredients of empowering people, creating a place and providing a space to allow activities to occur. And that message was actually initiated right from the beginning. Now, as Ted stated, is Sparbrook is a deprived area. But to take into the context of deprivation, it's very important to know where what the area is made of. And the ward was actually about 30,000 people. And out of the 30,000 people, 80% of the population were actually from the Bain communities. And the majority Bain community were predominantly from the Pakistani and Bangladeshi communities. But there is a unique feature in Sparkbrook uh, within a very small area, less than half a square mile, there's around about 130 charities that actually operate within the area that provide meaningful ways of actually connecting and supporting people. There are also a plethora of small voluntary community groups that actually work tirelessly within the community. However, not all communities are actually know or aware of what's going on. So there's a lot of passion, there's a lot of commitment from people to actually make some kind of transformative change. Where does Aging Better come in? Aging Better didn't start last year, it started nearly four years ago. Uh, no, sorry, coming up to about five years ago. And part of the role was that in the initial elements of Aging Better, they had a hub. And within the hub, they've actually supported some of the reason by 50, 60 types of uh, groups to actually run meaningful activities. 
So I had a very unique uh, position that I had a wealth of intelligence and local knowledge in the local communities that we can actually build and improve on. What tended to happen was that when I actually got involved, first three months of my life was always having conversations and having conversations with a number of organizations to identify, you know, what are their unique selling points? What was the kind of unique features that they had? And one of the key things that I tried to develop was it can never be done alone. To develop any kind of strategy involved working collaboratively with other people. And one of the key aspects at the beginning was about mobilizing people, but developing relationships. And what happened is how the relationships developed was actually in three tiers. And one was actually uh, trying to get larger organizations to actually develop a narrative of actually addressing issues affecting older people. And another one, which were very small organizations, which really required the nurturing and supporting of actually developing their kind of vision and mission. And the next final stage is actually the connectivities from the grassroots communities. And that actually provided a kind of mechanism. Uh, I call it like the waterfall effect is that you got the lottery providing the resources, you got uh, BVSC providing the scrutiny and the uh, framework. And then you had a group of organizations that were like anchor-based organization who had assets and resources and then supporting smaller groups. The outcome of this was that, again, a lot of conversations and trying to build something to identify which organization can deal and work on particular issues and try to support and nurture. And one of the presentations, which is Smart Women CIC, is just one of the organizations that were helped and how their journey from developing an idea and taking an idea into a meaningful activity and trying to actually make impacts in the communities they serve. At the end of the day, it is very difficult working in any communities, but how you can transform communities is by working together. Developing these relationships is not an easy task. It does not take six months. It does not take a year. It takes a number of years to develop those relationships, to develop the social capital in the communities that can actually provide services within the community. So that gives an outlook of what's being done. And the future is actually continuing that journey, developing those relationships, developing those uh, services, and trying to create an infrastructure that we have leaders within the community, practitioners providing services, but holistically trying to improve the quality of life for people over the age of 50. I'll hand it back to Ted. Well done, Naeem. Thanks very, thanks very much for that and within your allotted time as well. Um, okay. Uh, Rabina from Smart Women, do you want to... Um, Give an outline of what SWAT smart women do and where have you come from and your aspirations over the, the next the next while and the, and, and the number of women that you work with and stuff like that. You're on pause, Rabina. You're on mute, by the way. Oh, you did it. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, it. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. That's lovely. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, smart Women CIC, in, uh, uh, we started the work with the Smart Women CIC in uh, 2012, right? So this is not going to be, I think, uh, 10 years, more than 10 years. So uh, I used to work before in, with the grassroots organizations as well. So I have a lot of the experience with the grassroots uh, uh, grassroot organizations. So I start my own Smart Women CAC. What is the reason behind the, to start uh, the, our own organization? Because of the local demand. The women, especially our the women, they are in a very restricted uh, families. They they can't go out. out uh, they can't go in. I mean, they, they don't have the freedom in their families. 
But when I start these uh, organizations for women CIC, I had a lot of the pressure um, on my head as well. Why you open this one and uh, the women, yeah, they will come, they will do this and that. Yeah. But I said to uh, them, yeah, because the women, they need it. So what we did in a smart, in, in our organization, we uh, a small small uh, portion we make a small small portion like we have the gym so we can do the well-being session for them they can come they can start the gym we have the small classroom they can come here they can do the some kind of the training we have the beauty parlor so um, and we basically we create the place of trust there the women come here and they can discuss their issues uh, so we had a very uh, we had a very good experience in uh, with the smart women CAC at the moment with the work uh, for the women, particular for the work with the uh, over fifties. There is a, a lot of the issues we identify in past uh, eight nine years, but to be very honest, in the last. Uh, last two years, last year and this year, what we identify is a really, really a, a shocking. That's a lot of the issues, the grassroots, they are uh, suffering at the moment in their, uh, in their families, in their houses. So there is no a particular around a support for the women. A, a sport like, uh, uh, like the over organization, like the over centers, yeah, there is no other support here. The, the access for the services, there is no access for the services here. They don't have the access for the services here. The other thing is that uh, the women, the women, they are isolated. They have the lot of the issues in their uh, families, in their extended families, with their children, with the others. So these uh, are, are we identifying at least more than the 1500 women since last year. They are suffering uh most of the uh issues so we trying to uh we're trying to sort out their issues we're trying to help them with the other organization as like a name i always run to the name yeah name is uh, with us since uh, uh, when we start this organization to be very honest name is only one person yeah who been supporting us i'll be a very honest yeah i'm sorry about that but name is the only one person which always i just hold that name Come on, help us here. Yeah. And the name, uh, name said, Rubina, uh, why I'm helping? He will tell you why he is helping us anyway. But I'm just saying always. And he, even then as a night time, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, I phone to name, name, I'm stuck. I need this help. And name help me. Yeah. Name help. He's uh, ready to help us anyways. Yeah. And if I, if this is a very uh, true, if I'm saying, yeah, we are standing here. And uh, this is uh, for the support of the name, yeah. So name knows everything. I discuss all the issues with the name and name giving us a guideline, name giving us uh, everything. Because uh, first six to seven years, we don't have the funding. He did try every week, every month. He just uh, write down the love of the application for us. Yeah, but we turn back again. No, there is no smart woman CAC uh, can't get this uh, grant, can't get this. But anyways, yeah, he support us a lot, yeah, which is a uh, true. Okay, so we are the we are the evidence here this, for the name. Uh, I uh, the, if we will say the uh, issues for the, uh, the smart women CICs are facing and the aging, other, other things here, yeah, the aging better help help a lot as well because aging better give us a right path to us here. Yeah. Even though yeah, there was a small funding, even though there was a, a short time period here, yeah, but we did a lot of the activities with the aging better. And uh, by the, there's one thing I can see the aging better is a very short, uh, um, very short, uh, like a uh, three months program when the, when the women, they start this program. The, uh, when they're trying to familiarize this program and then after that the program is finished, we don't have the funding, then we start the uh, volunteer. So we did the lot of the volunteer work even then after uh, finishing our project with the aging better as well. We have, we just keep the uh, data on with these uh, last two, uh, three years program with the uh, aging better. So we had the data. So on this, uh, this pandemic, so we had a lot of the contacts. So we contact straight away to them. These women, they need the help. So we know what the help they needed. 
even then the small issues, even then the big issues, uh, or the women, you know, they, even the women, they just, when they have the issues, yeah, even the small issues, they just start to panicking to uh, to go to the, they said, oh, we want to go for the GP, but the GP didn't give us the appointment. We want to go to the hospital, but hospital didn't give us the appointment. And uh, we don't have that much support from the NHS. So I think the, I think there is a issue. There's a lot of the issues and we need to work out with the uh, over 50s. They, uh, even their mental health, their physical health, and, and we just did do, and this- You just, you just got one, you just got one minute left, Ravina, all right. Even then this, during this time, we, uh, the people, they are just all organization. They are closing down. The businesses are closing down. We took again the risk to get another building. Why we took the building? Because of, uh, uh, because of the demand. And the, yesterday we just sit down or then 20, 25 women, older women, they are registering their self because they are the isolated and they are the home. They, uh, they are nothing to do that. So uh, by the conclusion, there is a lot of the issues and we will discuss and when we will go after uh, two weeks time here, yeah, we will go on for one another meeting and we will discuss it. Yes, my minute is gone. That's your minute gone. Thanks very much, Rubina. <laughs> okay. You. And I'm sure there'll be some questions. And if not, I've got some questions to come come back and even something like that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, right. Um, now, Na Naeem 2, otherwise known as Cam. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the reason it's not because there was a problem with Link this morning, so she's coming on, on that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so if you, so as Cam said, she works for Asiana Community Project, uh, doing some of the wellbeing work, and she's going to talk about uh, the work she does with wellbeing with some of the women there, um, and also how they, it's used to recruit women and bring people into the organisation. So you've got your time and off you go. Thank you. So good morning and thank you for having me on. And I just want to mirror actually what Name has said that there is a, a great sense of satisfaction when you're working out in the community and doing something to support people that sometimes maybe have less advantage uh, or a disadvantage to getting access to some of the services. So um, knowing that Sparkbrook is, you know, in one of the areas which is clusters being deprived. Um, we had in our wellbeing hub, we had, we've got three huge outcomes um, which we work towards and we use that as a basis as to move forward to support women in the BAME community. And the outcomes all are linked to around improving women's wellbeing um, by reducing things like anxiety, depression, isolation, very much like also the, the, on the same lines of Rabina's work, um, you know, and getting them to participate in sort of a range of positive activities. And we're very hands-on. Um, so we work with women in the local area um, by inspiring them to start to think about looking after their physical health. Um, that normally is a very good starting point um, because who doesn't want to get fit? <laughs> who doesn't want to look after their health? In general, um, we get quite a good positive response um, from women who are looking to either enhance you know, their fitness or their diet so it's always a good starting point and so we have a range of physical activities and when I say we're hands-on we are hands-on because I lead three or four of those activities so I'm the yoga teacher I teach yoga and meditation and that has been very successful with our women in the community post-covid and during covid um, and we do run clubs where we have now women um, quite empowered to come out and run with us on the canal and we run 5k sometimes once a week sometimes twice yeah I know Ted waiting for you to join <laughs> and um, but actually one a beautiful story I can tell you about empowering women um, and it came to light during Covid was we were running regular run clubs Mondays and Fridays um, and we'd have six to eight women running every morning and during COVID, obviously things had to stop and we had to close a lot of our services and move online, which was a new new thing for, for all of us. Um, but 
some of the women got so inspired that they started running on their own. And that in itself is very, very uplifting and very, very powerful because before they would never feel like um, going out by themselves because they'd tell me that they feel worried or they'd be scared, things are unfamiliar. But what we found was we have now got women, when the COVID uh, rules had lightened a bit, they were running by themselves um, or in small little groups. And then they would send us little pictures on WhatsApp to say, look, I'm being cammed today and I've led the run. So it's very, very inspiring, but it's taken a lot of work. So it's not an easy thing for us to do. It takes a lot of nurturing. Um, it takes a lot of talking to people. Um, it takes a lot of inspiring people. And we constantly are, I think since the pandemic, we we've got a WhatsApp community group and there's about 165 members in that WhatsApp community group. And out of those, there were probably 140 community people in that as in local community who we share a daily inspirational message with. We tell them what activities we've got going on and it's been going on daily since March the 24th, 2020, when we first went into our first lockdown. And that's kept people, I'm hoping, from the feedback we get, people um, still keep in touch. It reduces some isolation um, and we've moved a lot of our activities onto an online platform, which has got its benefits, but there were some limitations because not everybody has access to um, social media platforms or, you know, internet in itself. So we've trying to improve the well-being of our women by offering a range of physical serve activities to help with their um, physical health, but also tap into them, their mental and emotional health. And once people start to, once our women start to feel like they're seeing a bit of a difference here and being supported, they then start to talk to us about other things that are bothering them. So it might be things that are going on at home that they're not comfortable with. It might be parenting, it might be looking after the elderly. Um, so we then start to offer coaching services where we've been coaching clients um, and giving them some strategies to help them cope during the pandemic and before and obviously now um, coming out of it. Um, so that taps into us building confidence and helping women to increase their own skills um, by doing, uh, by um, coming forward and actually sharing and saying well actually I'm struggling and that sometimes in Bain communities can be quite difficult to do because everything is kept behind closed doors and that's fine if you know but sometimes repressing those emotions can be a big burden on a person so we've got women now who come to us for coaching and mentoring and we're moving now into a stage where we're looking into offering them education so we're then getting them starting to get involved now we're coming out of lockdown into building the capacity for them to participate in social enterprise, volunteering. So we've got some great projects coming along. And with regards to aging better, um, our involvement with that, trying to target you know, the over 50s is we've just started um, this month and it's the worst month ever because it's raining, it's gardening. <laughs> So, um, but, you know, it's, um, we've started some gardening therapy. So ACP, we've got a huge garden in the back. It's great. We've got, um, we've got a, um, a CIC, a project coming in there who look after the garden for us. But we've also got a peace garden next to a church. It's all very, um, really nice space. And we're using that to target people to come out and get a bit of gardening therapy because we know that obviously, you know, we need to holistically work with supporting people that offer things. So you can be outdoors, do some gardening. We have a craft club, which is indoor and um, not in our space, but we're doing it online via Zoom where we give out embroidery packs. Um, and we are encouraging um, the younger generation to actually get the elders in their families also to maybe participate in things like the craft cl clubs and the embroidery. And we started once the lockdown restrictions were uh, lifted in small groups we've started walking nature so we've had to take off the run for now um, but we've started walking nature and we get like you know a few over 70 ladies who come to walk from the canal down to Akers we do that every Friday morning it's a great opportunity for 
women to get together, to offload a little, talk about things that are bothering them, talk about cooking, sharing recipes, and literally supporting one another um, to make sure that we are doing our best to provide an area um, which has had limited access, but is embracing um, the services that are available to them. So we're trying to be really visible um, all the time. We've got social media platforms um, on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Um, so, you know, check us out actually, if you've, um, if you've got those platforms and give us a like, that would be good. Um, but, and it's also a way obviously for communities to collaborate and see how we can work with one another too. Um, so I don't know if my time's up or whether yeah. Well, I, th I think there'll be. I've got some other questions as well to to, to come back to you. So if if that if, if that's yeah, yeah finish then. Okay, okay. Yeah. right. Um, there's there's no questions in the in the Q and A. We must have get, we must have been absolutely brilliant in our presentations. But I've got a few questions which I want to, and one of them is coming back to sort of um, both Cam and Vina's issue, but Nye might step in here. Um, it's this issue of. Um, locality and trust and um almost like walking distance access to services um and and do you think there's there's an issue within some communities of um just because we do something that's perhaps a bus ride away we just assume people will go to it or because we a lot of people who plan services drive and stuff like that Whereas what our, what the communities that you serve, they actually want something that they can pop to between 10 o'clock and 12 o'clock and then go home because they've got other duties and stuff like that. Do you want to say a bit more about, you know, um, all, all three of you, Rabina or, or, or Naima Cam, um, about having somebody that's sort of a micro local, which then access, accesses, allows people to access those services. Sure. I mean, if I can say where where um, we're located is um, around a park area, farm park, and around it surrounded, it's a very residential. A lot of the moms will drop the children off at school and they'll be meeting us between 9.15 and 9.30. So it's literally on their doorstep um, to come out for a walk or a run or um, a chat, whatever it might be. So it is very much like and then once they're done, it's like, right now I've got to go home and I've got a lo load of housework to do. So it is, it does for some make it a lot um, easier. That's actually through some of the questionnaires we send out on a um, almost a quarterly basis to women just to get feedback on the quality of the services and what they want to see improve. One of the, one of the most common things they say is they love the fact that it's on their doorstep and it's accessible. Um, and then I do get some women who will say, I wish um, I lived closer to where you were um, because I'd love to come and access the service. So it's a bit of, yeah. Bit of, yeah we, we, we've had a question in the Q&A to sort of follow that up. And perhaps Naeem, you can sort of jump, jump in here a bit. Because um, whilst Spark Brook and Bolsall Heath East is one particular water. <coughs> For those not in Birmingham, um, the, the, the ward of Springfield is slightly further south. It's right, it's adjacent to the Sparkbrook ward and it's, it's on, along the, the Stratford Road, which is a major sort of shopping area and there's, there's the superb clothes shops and food shops and stuff like that along there. And it, it goes out towards the suburbs of Hall Green and, and Acox Green, that part. Um, but do, do you get people coming as far? How far is your catchment? You know, do you cover the sort of spa, the Springfield area, and do you cover people like Britain Bulls or Heath and, and areas like that? You know, is it nine? I can answer that question. Um, when the program was designed, it actually identified the political ward of Spark Brook, and Birmingham at that time, pre twenty eighteen, had forty wards. And Sparbrook was identified as one of the wards. Um, but I think one of the major questions is, is that, is it beneficial to have area-based initiatives? And there seems or appears that when you have evidence to show that an area is being deprived or has uh, inequalities, then it, funding is actually then 
parachuted in to actually address those particular issues. However, we live in a homogenous community. Um, people are not fixated in geographical places. It's the people networks they have. And from the comments that are being made is that, you know, people who live in Sparkbrook have families in Springfield, have families in Small Heath. And you can't then start differentiating saying that, well, you live in this area and you need to give us support. The whole idea is you want to empower people so they can actually have experiences or journeys that empowers and improves the quality of life. Yeah. So if you want my answer, it shouldn't be area based. It should be people based. <laughs> um, but one of the questions I was actually there is uh, talking about, you know, some uh, BAME voices are not heard. And that has been resident, uh, resident for the last many years. Um, we have a very diverse community but also a very diverse community organizations. You can have an organization, uh, unincorporated or otherwise, with just one member of staff or even just one volunteer, to an extent that you can have up to 40 employees providing a service, uh, catering not only Sparkbrook, but the wider area. And it comes to the point of balance. It's actually identifying an organization about its ability to reach, access but there is a responsibility not just with the funders but with organizations to ensure that there is an equality in the service provision that they have measures to actually get access and reach within the communities uh, but it's, it's also important to actually work within communities within those particular cohorts of particular vein communities that there is a voice there and not purely on the uh, demographics, but also about issues as well. And I'll just bring one point forward. Uh, one of the meet, well, part of Aging Better, they had a number of meetings and these meetings were mostly people over the age of 50. And it gave an opportunity for them to actually address particular issues. And one key factor came out and it was that people over the age of 50 were looking after their parents in their 70s. Um, at that time, Nobody actually addressed or brought those particular issues in the local area. But working with a number of uh, grassroots organizations, a survey consultations was done and actually identified it wasn't an isolated narrative in a group meeting. It is quite c common in the communities where there are a lot of people over the age of 50 with life limiting conditions looking after elders. So we develop a narrative, we develop knowledge and intelligence and then it's trying to get organizations to actually voice those to stakeholders to influence change in the future. So I think one of the points in regards to, uh, uh, you know, the voices of being communities, it hasn't stopped and it has to continue, but there has to be a social responsibility for key stakeholders to ensure that everybody is represented and it's actually going back to a grassroots level to actually get those voices heard because a lot of people are making those voices but it's finding the platforms to get those connected voices to actually make a difference. Okay we've had another question which says we already know that there are many groups within the BAME community. Um, how do you initially make contact with them bearing in mind the language barriers um, are there any suggestions that you'd recommend to make the first contact? So, um, Cam, how, how do you make, first of all, given the fact that, you know, and, and I, I worked at the school within the area, you know, we, had, we had 54 languages in, in, in that school and stuff like that. So given that sort of diverse language base, um, how, how do you, you know, how, how, how do you how, how do you overcome that within your within organizations and within the services that you then look at developing right um, sorry Ted. i don't know whether my internet went then but that was a very bro that was really broken so i didn't catch that okay question. Ba basically the question is um it, it's how many we know that the the, the bain the bain community the bain, the bain community is is diverse how do you how do you make contact with them because of the language issues, uh, and have you got any suggestions about making first contact? So if you start first on how that, that you do that within the women's club and stuff like that, and then we'll, we'll go around the other participants. Um, I mean, we are diverse in the sense that we all speak 
various community languages. So I'm fluent in Punjabi. I can speak a bit of Urdu. My colleagues have got their skills in their languages. So when we connect with people, I think the barrier of language gets broken straight away. So it kind of brings it down a little and it makes people feel at ease. Um, so I think initially we will speak to them if we need to in a community language. Um, if they've come to the centre for some particular advice or support, um, and they may have been referred. Um, but um, we will then find a colleague in the office who will be able to, and then we'll use them as a translator. Okay, thanks. So I hope that uh, it does. It does. Answers that um, question. Rabina, the amount, Rabina, the amount of the women that you have come into your centre, um, is there a language issue with with participants, and uh, you know, how do you overcome that? With the language issues. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have the uh, at the moment we have the registered forty five volunteers with us at the moment. Okay, so they are we have the, all the popular languages in in this area, particularly the Mirpuri, Punjabi, Pashto, Potohari, and uh, Urdu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you, you don't know the Pashto. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From the tribal areas in the Pakistan, it's a pretty good. <laughs> Um, Atak and uh, the other uh, languages. So, because uh, um, I, I like I said, I told you we are connected with a very grassroots. Yes. So, yeah. I I know personally. I know all of these languages. Personally, if you can say to me, yeah. because my in-laws they are from the uh, Pashto families. Yeah. So, uh, my other families they are from the Islamabad, so Urdu, Pashto, Punjabi, Putwai. So, all of the uh, popular language, even then the Bengalis. Yeah. Out of yes. those of the Bengalis, they're visiting in our centers. So, I know the big Bengali. Okay. Well. Yeah. So okay. we know these uh, all popular um, BME languages, all the languages. So we know that. Yeah. So when they come, yeah, when we speak uh, with their languages, so they get the more confidence, or uh, uh, then they can uh, discuss their issues with us uh, uh, in a very, you know, in a friendly way. And can okay. I add yep. something? Yes, you can. You can. Um, the one key aspect within Sparkbrook is that there are a number of places and those places have connectivity with people. And when people actually are in a particular area, they get to know each other. So when you're talking about contacting or engaging, you usually find that there is always a passionate individual, call it active citizen or somebody who's a super volunteer who will actually connect with a number of organizations. And they are usually like, you know, point of contacts in the community. So when there's any kind of issue, you may go to that particular person. That person may have access to around about two, 300 people. Now, if you carry that across different communities, you build up a very strong uh, infrastructure of point of contacts. And how you actually make those uh, connections stronger is ensuring that the organization that you're working with have that repertoire of skills of volunteers and staff that actually speak community languages, but also connect with communities. So it's a kind of a narrative that continues and it is changing. And there are new communities uh, coming in, but there's also established communities that have virtually never engaged with any kind of external uh, service. So it's a growing story, but again, it comes to the point of not just one stake stakeholder, it's many stakeholders working together, collaborating to ensure that services, the, the awareness of services, access to services, so that there's greater connectivity. But it's a journey and it's a story and a narrative that's always continuing. Okay, um, th thanks. Th thanks thanks, for that. Um, one of the other questions I've got is, and I think Cam alluded to it, was, um, and, and part of that question was, uh, and part of that question was, um, alluding to it as well, from a publicity point of view and getting stuff off the ground, are we talking um, online? Are we talking leaflets? 
or are we talking word of mouth? And how 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 do services grow? And what's the sort of mix and match with your service development between those three processes? Okay, I know we've been through COVID and stuff like that, but generally, let's let's look at before COVID, and let's look at during COVID and stuff like that. Um, how do people find out about your services, and which is the best way for them for, for you to develop it and stuff like that? Okay. Um, um, so before COVID, we were very much using leaflets, posters, um, and we were contacting, um, and we still are, we would, uh, we'd made connections with schools and we would send it to their, their heads in schools who would then put things out in newsletters for their parents in the local area. That would be one way. Um, or it would literally be leaflet drops in the local area. Um, so we've done that as well. Um, and then when COVID happened, I think um, we had to find our, uh, our inner creativity and we literally somehow very organically just went online um, and started to use that as a platform um, and the features with online is you can tag you can use hashtags and you can tag different uh, um, charities and organizations that are local so then they start to know what's going on um, and that kind of spreads the message. Um, and then we're encouraging our members to maybe um, get onto the platform because that enhances their knowledge as well. So it's a way of also saying, right, you know, it's not this social media is not just for the youngsters. Tell your youngsters, <laughs> you know, and, and get onto it. Um, and that's still an ongoing thing. We've actually got somebody who does. Uh, on our team, digital inclusion. So she encourages women, shows them how to get onto Zoom so then they can access some of the services. And so we do sessions on that as well. Um, so a lot of it is, and then we had an opportunity where we were able to, I think for um, from March till, gosh, it was probably till September, I was on a weekly um, session on Birmingham Updates, which was a media platform and I was delivering mindfulness and meditation and wellness tips every half an hour on a Tuesday. And we'd, that reached across Birmingham and beyond. Um, and we engaged quite a lot of um, people feeling being interested in what we were doing. Um, and that kind of spread the word. And since then, I think yeah. it's just organically just grown. It's just it's something we just keep putting out. We just keep pushing it out. Rabina, um, how do how do women find out about your your activities there? Okay, uh, over in our in our centre, yeah, most of them uh, word mouth, yeah, right, because we have the more than uh, fifteen hundred contact in our um, in our database, right. So we send them when we start any activities. Um, anything so we send them the messages here yeah. so they got the messages straight away the other thing is that yeah because uh, we are living in a locally so local people local women yes yeah. so mother uh, sister-in-law other uh, relatives yet yeah. so they know to each other i got the most of the volunteers so they got their extended families in their areas as well so when we do uh, anything any activities yeah they just got the state away there yeah. uh, uh, they, and the other thing is that we just make a you know the small group whatsapp group yeah so with a small uh, number of the people like uh, uh, one group is uh, there is a uh, different uh, uh, religious and different uh, faith uh, women yeah so yeah. they they got their contact yeah the other group is the same is like that yeah so they're sharing their ideas and the, in the, nowadays, you know, that everyone's using the social media. So if you will send me anything, so I will send all my contacts. So they got to just stay away. Yeah. So the other thing, word of our mouth. Yeah. So connect to the people. People step in. The women step in in the um, center and the leaflet as well. So uh, before the pandemic, yeah, we done nearly uh, sixty thousand leaflet for in our center. So we have the contact from there as well. Uh, so uh, this is this is the, how they can get the easily what the activities we are doing. So 
they got the information. Thank, thank. Um, uh, can I just add? Um, um, yeah, yeah. I'm, it's gonna, from it's my gonna experiences yeah. working with uh, small grassroots organisations, um, most organisations have volunteers and users, and if a message has to go into the communities, it's actually getting the message into the beneficiaries, the users, and what smart women's identified that they had a, well, a database of 1500 people. Well, in our communities, it's that's the magnitude of people that the contacts that they have. So it's not just smart women CIC, there are many other grassroots organizations. There's one organization that actually provided services for older men and they had access to around about 250 men and they were providing a service, but it actually linked in to the kind of work that was done nearly 40, 50 years ago. So they kept that connectivity, but it's actually getting those uh, messages out there. So the strength within the community is the ability to actually get messages out there, but it's again, try to ensure they get the right connections to get the right messages out there in the communities. Okay. Um yeah, uh, what, an additional question, because it, it's all sort of been raised and stuff like that. Um, we hear a lot about digital inclusion at the moment and older people aren't involved in engaging it. And yet we've all said that, you know, on what we're on WhatsApp group and we're on... Um, the, how, how do you think the community has responded to getting older people online? Like during the, the pandemic and stuff like that, there's been a lot of issues, um, like services going online, people can't access them. And yet, Cam, you were talking about it, um, Rabina, you were talking about, um, you know, WhatsApp groups and stuff like that. A family supported older people, have you got evidence of family supporting older people about going online so that they can then access those those services? And perhaps that's something we can, we, we, we can do. Um, Cam, do you want to do that one first? Yeah, sure. I think um, it's not it's not as it's not easy um, for, for sure. Um, and there there are there are pockets of people who haven't got access to the online. Um, and you know, there's still a lot of work to be done around that at the at the moment. So. The ones that do have access um, are probably the ones that are a little bit more um, in tune with their own physical and mental health. So they know how to get to how to access a service or they've been to the centre um, and they've been part of the community for such a long time mm. that they know that they can come in and they can ask um, how to, you know, come on to a service. We've got some over 70s that join me for um a walk in nature and they're on whatsapp and they're yeah. on zoom um and that's only because by talking to me they've said cam show me how to use it so i've shown them and then they've been able to access it and then they just start to familiarize and like anything it's just a consistency of use um but there's still a lot of work to be done with getting it out to people who are a lot older because obviously um you know maybe they just haven't got that support around them so we're still working on that okay and and Ravina, did you give support to your women who wanted to get online and what you know, whatsapps and stuff like that how did how did you yes uh if we will talk about before uh, the pandemic before, yes. So the women, they can come in the center if they need anything, yeah, they just phone us and then we can help them. Yeah, but during the pandemic, yeah, because we had the particular programs grant as well. So uh, our volunteer, they, uh, our volunteer, they just uh, helping uh, the women, even then they go to their houses, yeah, because these are the young girls as well. So they know, they're familiar with the, uh, with the internet and how to use it okay. and that. So we just uh, showed them as well mostly the uh, mostly uh, the women yeah like a camp said yeah they you know they're not familiar with this but in their houses yeah they're using the whatsapp 
on a regular basis. Now, WhatsApp is a very easy. We can't yeah. go even then the other, uh, you know, the Facebook and the Instagram. Yeah. But we just find that the WhatsApp is uh, easier. So if we show them, okay, this, this, this is the ha this is the phone, so you can do, you can go on this app, yeah, then you can press the button and they easily connect to, um, connect to each other. Yeah. So I find the WhatsApp is a uh, very easy for them. Yeah, yeah I would agree with that. WhatsApp is the, um, you know, the signals you can't receive all the <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, 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 te that's technology for you, if the, if the satellite's not working. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're talking along, yeah, and then other side, yeah, you will see, oh, signal gone drop, yeah, and they say, oh, what did you say? And then yeah. you're going to Yeah, 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 what, what did I say? Um, um, we, we've only got a couple of minutes left. There's one, there's another question just popped up. Um, do you run any music-based activities? Do we run any music-based activities within this? Within this? Uh, the mice are in, in here. Uh, have you run any, amongst your women's group in there, have you, have you done any music-based activities? Is, Ravina, it's a... No, we uh, no, we don't, but not on a regular basis. Yeah, once yeah. Like, like a party or something, yeah, come yeah, here. Yeah, but... A competition for the yeah. singing and... Uh, uh, something like that, uh, but we don't have any uh, support for that here for those. Okay, but we, we, we are looking at arts activities. We were talking, but it's like we talked about that with Rabina earlier on. We are looking at developing arts activities within the group to widen their offer, and that's with um, a local arts forum, um, which is R and R. We're also involved with. Cam, do you do any sort of music based? Um, the only music is not as in like as in playing instruments. And stuff. Well, anything that's sort of music, exercise. anything that's music focused rather yeah, no, than well, no, well being. Exercise, yeah, exercise to Bangra music. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. About as, as <laughs> we got the, 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 the Bangra size and, and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. 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 No, we haven't actually um, got anything in the music sector. Okay, yeah, and and, and as, I just, as I said, you know, from the, from, it's something that we've been exploring because a lot of the groups that have grown up within the area and have developed within the area, I've always done that sort of welfare support and that sort of traditional support that comes with some of these deprived communities. One of the role of the arts forum um, is beginning to look at how we introduce those sorts of activities into that offer. Um, as an arts activity and not just as part of a well-being activity um, and, 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 and developing that as well. Um, and it's now 11 o'clock, so if, unless there's any other questions, I think Vicky's back to um, uh, get yeah, people uh, sort of, yeah, okay, I, I think that's about it. I think there's no more questions that we've, we've covered everything. Um, Thank you very much for all the other, for, for Cam, Naeem and Rabina. Thank um, thanks, Vicky, for putting mm. this on and hosting us. And Not at all. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much to all of you for taking part um, and sharing your insights and experiences with us. It's, um, you know, it, it's such an important conversation. Um, so thanks for being part of our Festival of Learning on our final day. Thank okay. You. Yeah, thanks very much right. for that. And, uh, and thanks to everyone that's attended. I know people probably need to shoot off because there's another session starting at 11 as well. So uh, I shall yeah. um, finish the webinar now and uh, hope to connect with you again. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Then. Yeah. Take care Thank and look after yourselves. Bye bye. Take bye. care. Bye bye. Bye bye.